Live from KSAT 12, the 6 o'clock news starts right now. A guilty verdict for a man on trial for killing his girlfriend two years ago. Before that verdict was read, the defense tried to convince the jury that there was no evidence to prove that Jorge Izquierdo fatally shot Cora Nickel. Our Erica Hernandez has been following the trial all week and brings us the closing arguments and today's verdict. A possible suicide, an accident, a sloppy investigation, all ways the defense tried to sway the jury in Jorge Izquierdo's murder trial. Izquierdo on trial for the August 2020 murder of his girlfriend, Cora Nickel. Nickel was found laying near a kitchen sink by her two young daughters in a pool of blood with a single gunshot wound to the head. Defense attorney Jennifer Zarka said that there was no eyewitness to what actually happened. All the evidence related to the actual shooting is circumstantial. We don't know. None of us can know what happened inside. We don't know. Zarka continued that what the state presented wasn't enough. The state provided zero evidence in this case, zero evidence that George pulled the trigger and fired that weapon. The state fired back in closing and said they did do enough and that Izquierdo left enough evidence behind to implicate himself. He gave you everything you need to know that he killed her beyond a reasonable doubt intentionally by holding a gun to her head, pushing her down in the sink, and murdering her. The evidence left behind included a 40 caliber spent shell casing and Izquierdo's car keys which were found in the backyard next to the fence. In the end, it was enough, and after about two and a half hours, a verdict was read. We, the jury, find the defendant, George Esquerdo, guilty of the offensive murder as charged in the indictment. Erica Hernandez, KSAT 12 News. And right now, the punishment phase of the trial is still going on. We'll be sure to keep you up to date on air and online once we learn it. A San Antonio track coach is in jail on charges of indecency with a child involving a 14-year-old girl. The girl told authorities that 36-year-old Andrew Brunson inappropriately touched her, recorded her, and shared explicit videos of himself with her. Investigators say this went on from January to June. They believe it happened during the victim's training sessions at local high schools. The arrest affidavit did not specify what locations. Records show that Brunson is not registered as an educator with the Texas Education Agency. Tonight, we're learning one of the men charged in the deadly June tractor trailer incident has pled not guilty, according to the U.S. Magistrate's Office. Christian Martinez entered a not guilty plea this morning. Martinez, as well as Homero Zamorano, were indicted in July following the deaths of 53 people who were in the back of that sweltering 18-wheeler. If the men are found guilty of the charge of conspiracy to transport and transport resulting in death, they face a maximum penalty of life in prison or the death penalty. And a historic international takedown of a human smuggling ring. Four Guatemalan men were arrested, indicted, and are awaiting extradition to the U.S. This marks the first case of its kind in Guatemala. The Justice Department and its partner agencies, including Homeland Security and Border Patrol, announcing today that the top leadership of a smuggling ring named Alpha Siete were made possible by the Joint Task Force Alpha. The investigation began in the spring of last year after the death of a migrant woman whose family had paid $10,000 to the smugglers. In April of 2021, HSI Midland received information from HSI Guatemala concerning the potential death of a female Guatemalan national in Midland, Odessa area. The investigation revealed that the deceased person appeared to be ill or dehydrated and had to be carried into a stash house in Odessa where she subsequently died. The operation also led to the seizure of cash, firearms and 10 vehicles. The men face four federal charges and if convicted could face life in prison. The Uvalde football team carrying the memories of the Romb Elementary victims onto the field this season and beyond. The team started a new tradition in the wake of the school shooting. RJ Marquez visited Uvalde to talk to coaches and players about how the Coyotes are honoring the lives that were lost. We want people to remember and not to forget. 
Weeks after the tragedy in Uvalde, Coach Wade Miller and the football team searched for ways to honor the victims. I said, what do y'all want to do? And they were kind of like, well, if you retire something, you forget about it. The team decided to have a senior who represented the values of the tight-knit community wear number 21 in memory of the 19 students and two teachers. It's a big blessing to be out here with my brothers again and just practicing and getting back at it. Justin Rendon will be the first in a long line of seniors to wear number 21 for the Coyotes. We're a real small community, but we're all coming together on, the, on those Friday nights and everybody will be able to see each other, be happy. Senior teammates and coaches voted for Justin to wear the number 21 jersey in honor of the Robb Elementary School victims. Justin said that he was in shock, but that it is an honor to wear that jersey and he understands what it means to this community. I was also really blessed that I'm able to represent my community and the lives that were lost at Robb Elementary. Coach Miller and Justin senior teammates say there is no better person to take on this responsibility. He just represents the city of Uvalde, hardworking, loves his community, and wants to do things the right way. And that's that's just Justin in a T right there. We voted on him. Uh, Justin's always here. He, he's encouraged me also to you know to get out there and be vocal at the same time. I look up to him also. And with the season on the horizon, there is a sense this football team can help with the healing process. It could have been a lot, especially if we win that first game, get that first W for everybody, for all the parents and everybody. It'll be really emotional to put that jersey on and be able to run out on the field with it. Reporting in Uvalde, RJ Marquez, KSAT 12 News. This story first aired on KSAT News Now. It's a streaming newscast and daily podcast. You can join RJ Marquez and Alicia Barrera every weekday at 11 a.m. You can find News Now on KSAT.com, KSAT Plus, YouTube Live, and wherever you get your podcasts. And now we're shifting gears, and that's because the city is shifting its plans to redevelop Broadway Avenue into park. They have long planned to redevelop the corridor from the border with Alamo Heights into the heart of downtown. Voters approved part of the project back in 2017. But the city's been recently butting heads with the state over this, over the reduction in lanes that would come with those plans. Our Garrett Berger joins us live along Broadway this evening to explain all this and where we are now. Garrett. So the state still owns more than two miles of Broadway, stretching from I-35 up to Burr Road near the Alamo Heights border. Basically, the Pearl up to near UIW. Now, the, in January, the commission that oversees TxDOT stopped a long-planned transfer of that section of roadway to the city. Why? Because the city's plans for a complete street vision with landscaping, bike lanes, and, a, and expansive sidewalks would mean cutting these six lanes of traffic down to four. Now, city officials say or said earlier this week they thought they had a compromise plan that would soothe state concerns about capacity and congestion. The project would essentially remain the same, including the lane reductions, but with changes to make traffic flow more efficiently. However, city officials say a meeting today with the heads of TxDOT and the Transportation Commission made it clear that for the state, it's six lanes or nothing. And now TxDOT will be coming up with its own plan, which city officials are still waiting to see. What they told us was that they're going to come up with a new plan, uh, that it's going to include six lanes, uh, and that it's going to improve uh, the safety of the corridor as well as traffic flow and multimodal connectivity. How they accomplished that, uh, we didn't find that out, but we look forward to seeing what they have in store. The city manager says for now all the local funding for this project is on hold. The city says that's about $65 million in all. But that's all relating to the project north of I-35. South of I-35 in the downtown area, that's city-owned roadway. And that's already under construction and is unaffected by the squabble between the city and the state. Live on Broadway, I'm Garrett Berger, KSAT 12 News. All right, thank you, Garrett. Let's take a look at traffic out there at this hour, and we're going to go to I-35. This is I-35 here at Loop 410. Always kind of a tricky interchange, but especially at 6 o'clock, those northbound lanes slow going as they typically are during this time of day, but no real problems to tell you about. The state didn't want traffic on Broadway, but can't avoid that on I-35 and 410. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> and you know what? Um, I guess we're doing a good job of avoiding rain. It looks kind of green from this picture. Mm. Sort the of. trees do, the yeah. grass not so much. Okay, so don't look too close. <laughs> yeah, don't look too basically. close. We've All done a right. really good glasses. job at avoiding rain. I mean, really good job this uh, this summer. 103 was the high today. That tied a record 
set back in 1951. It was also set in 2011, that really hot year. So uh, we had set a record again today. 79 was low this morning. And you look at the highs around the area. We got up to 105 Pleasanton, 103 Honda, 103 New Braunfels, 104 in Gonzales. Brutally hot. Here's the good news. We are going to cool down a little bit as we get into tomorrow and Saturday. There are some small rain chances, not great rain chances, but chances nonetheless. We're going to talk about those chances and look ahead to the weekend forecast coming up, guys. Thanks for that, Justin. All right, papers, pencil, crayons, and glue sticks. It's time to stock back up for school. With inflation affecting pretty much everything now, we did some homework and comparison shopping. We visited four stores and priced the school supplies on the list for a third grade in NEISD. Here's the report card. Office Depot cost the most at more than $39. Walmart, HEB, and Target were fairly close. Each of those baskets cost less than 20. Two tips to keep in mind, buy unsharpened pencils, they cost less, and if you shop tomorrow through Sunday, you'll pay no sales tax on most clothing, shoes, and school supplies. Expect stores to be packed. <laughs> All right, let's turn to elections now. Like most Texas voters, the Latino community aware the biggest race come November is between Governor Greg Abbott and Beto O'Rourke. Then there's the congressional midterms. The outcomes could tip the 50-50 balance, affecting which direction the nation goes from here. Tonight, Jesse DeGoyado tells us what else is behind the projected record turnout among Latino voters. That I know of, we have never been wrong when we project something. Its president, Lydia Camarillo, says Southwest Voter Registration and Education Project predicts nationally 15 million more Latino voters, including a million more in Texas, will turn out for the November midterms. If they do show up in November, it would be a radical reversal of their long history of low voter turnout in Texas. Camarillo says, unlike in the past. The Latino voters understand that through their vote, they're gonna make a difference, and that's where we're seeing a dramatic change. Camarillo believes it's due to what she calls the Trump effect. And she says, by Texas adopting voter suppression laws, both now compounded by the demand for stronger gun laws after Uvalde, and the loss of a woman's right to choose. Camarillo says Latino voters have had enough. Yeah, basta, we're gonna use our vote to defend our community and protect our communities. And I think that that's how Texans are feeling. Regardless of why they vote for or against any party, Camarillo says it's clear. Latinos will vote for those candidates and that party that is working in their interest. Jesse Degollado, KSAT 12 News. Still ahead here at six o'clock, why specific genes could be the reason that some people struggle to lose weight. That story coming up after the break. I'm Stefania Jimenez, and here's what we're working on for you tonight on The Night Beat. The Uvalde shooting investigation front and center in court. The questions that one state senator asked after the Uvalde DA took the stand. Plus, a new route of health inspections, three restaurants, multiple violations. What inspectors found behind the kitchen door tonight. Also, we're breaking down the rising price of energy bills. We're going to tell you the biggest factor that's driving up prices and also what you can do to save money. We'll see you for these stories and a lot more tonight on The Night Beat. All right, you eat healthy, you exercise, yet the numbers on your scale just keep going the wrong way. Well, if your health habits and your goals are the same as a friend's, let's say, but you're not seeing the same results, there might be a reason why. Researchers at the University of Virginia say that your genes might be at play there. Ursula Perry shows us now they've identified specific genes that may be making some people struggle and others stay on track. With more than 41% of Americans considered obese, it's a critical question. When diet and exercise fail, what else can people do to get to a healthy weight? We uh, really need uh, to develop drugs that are safe and that can be used for the average person. Researchers at the University of Virginia have taken the first step by studying a tiny invertebrate. It's a worm called the C. elegans. It has a very similar genetic makeup to humans. The scientists have identified 14 genes that may put people at higher risk for gaining weight. So if you eat the same that your cousin that doesn't have that variant, you are more likely to become obese. The researchers have also identified three gene variants that may do the opposite. People with these genes can eat more and maintain a healthy weight. 
With specific targets identified, O'Rourke says researchers could develop drugs that would inactivate the genes, which in turn could accelerate weight loss. This gene discovery could open the door to more tests using FDA-approved drugs that are used for other things that may also impact that obesity gene. And by the way, that worm that's used for these studies is useful because the worm shares 70% of the genes we have as humans. Who knew? Ursula Perry, KSAT 12 News. Let's take a look outside with Sky 12. I know we were optimistic about the greenery from the trees, but we all know you look down on the ground, things are crunchy. It is just hot out there. We can be optimistic about the slim rain chances. Mm, slim. Slim? Slim. Okay. Yeah. Well, you see a lot of people are finding shade, though, there downtown, yes. so that's good. Another another reason for those trees. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> they do a lot of good. Hey, we're going to start with the drought monitor because, uh, you know, we are dealing with pretty significant drought at this point. Didn't really change much, though, from last week. We're still at 97% of the state within drought. And uh, you see that sort of maroon color there. That is exceptional drought. It has spread a little bit. But really, it's it's the same places. I mean, uh, basically all of our viewing area here at this point is within exceptional or extreme drought. And you know the situation uh, if you've been outside. Uh, let's check in on Medina Lake to see where we are there. It continues to drop 10% full. It's down 70 feet. Over the last three months, it's down 14 and a half feet. And uh, it could go even lower. Now, during the drought back in 2014, 2015, it dropped as low as 3%. So there is, it's not as bad as the last drought, but it's, it's working in that direction. Highest today, 103 here in town, 103 Honda, 99 Curva, 104 in Gonzales, 105 in Pleasanton. And now we've had 55 days so far this year at 100 or above. We are awful close to taking over second place, uh, which was set back in 2011. 59 set back in 20, uh, 2009. It seems inevitable we're going to get there. I mean, just based on the forecast going forward, we're going we're to set this record as August promises to be just as hot as July. At least that's the way it's looking. So we've got outside for you right now. We've got some thin cirrus clouds working through. Still temperatures at 102 at the airport. 103 Stinson, 102 Kelly, 101 at Randolph. And we've got a southeasterly breeze. Looking at the satellite picture, there are those cirrus clouds I was talking about coming in from the north and east. So they'll slide through this evening. We've got a few clouds here in the air, but nothing that's producing any rain, unfortunately. Uh, and as we look at the uh, numbers here around the area, 100 Boulevard, 102 New Braunfels, it's 100 in Seguin still, 100 in Gonzales, 100 in Bandera. Some breeze, there is a breeze there. Uh, we, we like to see that. Some gusty winds from time to time, gusting to 21, degree, uh, 21 miles per hour at the airport, gusting to 20 miles per hour at Stinson. And it has ushered in a little bit of moisture, although dew points have made their way down into the 50s. So we've kind of lost the heat index until you go east of San Antonio. And that's where it starts to kind of kick in again. Feels like 103 right now in Gonzales. Feels like 103 down there at Stinson. Our case had 12 hour forecast, 96 degrees at 8 o'clock. It's a slow cool down this evening, 83 midnight, 83 by 1 a.m. We'll probably drop into the upper 70s tomorrow morning with some cloud cover before seeing mostly sunny skies again on your Friday. Uh, the forecast temperature tomorrow around 100 here in San Antonio. Maybe slightly cooler off to the east where we see a little bit more moisture. And here's what we're watching. You'll notice we've got some showers and storms here around New Orleans for parts of Louisiana. That energy is working towards Texas, and some of that moisture will be. This is a look at the moisture in the atmosphere. Where you see these orange colors, that represents some of that deeper moisture working into east Texas tomorrow. It starts to funnel into some of our eastern counties, and then by Saturday, spreads towards San Antonio. So I think this is what will help us get a few pop-up showers and storms going. It's not a great chance, but the chance is there. Let's look at the forecast. And we'll go to, into tomorrow and fast forward here to 5 o'clock. You notice a few showers trying to pop up. 10% chance on your Friday afternoon. Saturday, maybe a little bit more widespread. By the afternoon, we'll put in a 20% chance. Not everyone's going to get rain. This is not a drought buster, as we say. But at least it's in the forecast. The extended forecast, uh, 100 tomorrow, 98 Saturday. And then after that, I still think we see a few showers, but they're generally relegated to the coast. So 100 Sunday, 100 Monday with some coastal showers, 101 on Tuesday. And it is next week when we'll probably set those records for most 100 degree days in a year. guys. I think I've lost track of the records. I know you guys are keeping track, but so we just many. keep breaking them. We do. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks, Justin. Mm -hmm. Now we're, we're baking here in San Antonio, but the Dallas Cowboys are taking in the cool California climate. 
but there's some new faces that might be breaking a sweat out there. Yes, uh, Dallas Cowboys added a veteran linebacker from the Minnesota Vikings. Not too long ago, this guy was one of the best in the NFL, but injuries recently have slowed him down. Greg Simmons is in Cali with more on that. And Sotomayor Varsity Volleyball is getting ready for its first season. Coming up. Camping with KZAN, powered by Davis Law Firm. The Dallas Cowboys have signed veteran linebacker Anthony Barr. It's a $2 million deal that can increase to $3 million with incentives. He's an eight-year NFL veteran and can help Cowboys second-year linebacker Micah Parsons. Barr is a four-time Pro Bowl selection and will head to Dallas after eight seasons in Minnesota, where he had a career-high three interceptions last season to go with two and a half sacks and 72 total tackles. And I know just personally competing against Anthony, he was always a challenge for us, uh, particularly in protection and, and just because of his flexibility playing on the ball inside and, you know, excuse me, off the ball inside and off the ball as, as a rusher and so forth. So we always had to be very, very conscious of, of the matchup uh, that you had with him. So I, I think anytime you have a player that brings matchup capability, as an, you know, it, it's, it's a real asset. With more from Cowboys training camp in Oxnard, California, let's check in with our Greg Simmons. Thanks a lot, Larry. Now, we have not seen Barr on the field just yet. You did mention earlier about his injury, so he's going through a little bit more extensive uh, physical, if you will, before he's cleared to play. But we were able to visit with one of the Cowboys kickers coming into camp for the Panthers, and he is also being teamed with Jonathan Garibay out of Texas Tech. His name is Liram Hirolathu, who played in the CFL before getting shots with the Cowboys, the Panthers, Washington, and now the Cowboys again. He told us today he has three degrees, one undergraduate, two masters, including an MBA and sports management, and it's the sports master's degree that serves him well as a kicker. He's even written a book. I actually did my uh, master's in uh, like in I actually wrote like the first kicking book. So if a high school coach were to pick up a book, they can look at it technically. This is what the kicker should be doing. These are the drill they should be doing. So I created that. And then a part of me is like, I wanted to learn more about the mental. Because in this league, it's like, look at all the kickers around the NFL. Every one of them is going to be within like four or five yards. You know, Justin Tucker's going to be 66. Some might be at 61, 60, right? But it's a matter of who's going to be able to put it between the ears and be focused on that. And it's pretty cool because he goes for this visualization process. It starts the night before practice and actually on the day of practice as well. His dad, by the way, was a professor, if you couldn't tell. Both Liram and Jonathan have struggled in camp. That's why they were made part of today's mojo moment to try and get them more reps. We'll see if that helps. And coming up tonight on the night beat, Demarcus Lawrence, D-Law, lays down the law. Live from Oxnard, Greg Simmons, KSAT 12 Sports. Thank you, Greg. Let's take you to brand new Sotomayor High School, where it's an exciting time for the volleyball program. Led by head coach Sarah Morris, the Wildcats are getting ready for their first season of varsity competition. The school is still under construction, but the gym was ready to go on Monday in time for their first practice. Coach Morris said the majority of her squad comes from Harlan High School, along with others from O'Connor and out of school districts. The volleyball team is the very first one to practice at the school. I mean, that's pretty cool. They're already making history and loving every minute of it. It has been a dream come true, super exciting. I've been extremely blessed with the leadership that I've been able to work under thus far with uh, Coach Morales as our athletic director and Coach Kelly Gobel as our assistant athletic director. I'm so excited, you know, just being here with a new team, being able to create history, you know, make, um, just make new things, make new traditions that will carry out throughout, like when we're already gone, you know, like just throughout lifetime. Well, we came on on Monday for tryouts and we were like, we're the first people to ever walk in this gym, to play in this gym, and it's like amazing. Those two said they absolutely love Coach Morris. Sotomayor will open its inaugural season on Monday, August 8th at East Central High School. There she is waving. Yeah, that's a pretty cool thing. <laughs> right. Well, they think practicing there first, how about getting the first win there? That'll be probably just <laughs> a little bit cooler. Yeah. That'll up a level. <laughs> Appreciate yes, that, Larry. Still to come, our KSAT Q&A. We're talking to the superintendent of Northside ISD next. 
Can our state have a budget surplus at the same time and its public schools be underfunded? That is a question posed by our guest today uh, in a recent article that he wrote for the San Antonio Express News. We'd like to welcome Dr. Brian Woods, the superintendent of Northside ISD. Dr. Woods, thank you for being here today. Uh, you said the answer to that question is yes, that the state can have a surplus and yet public schools still be underfunded. Why is that? That's uh, that's happening because of a combination of factors, uh, at least partly related to COVID, but not completely. Uh, what's happened to us schools in a, in a lot of the urban areas of our state, including San Antonio and Bear County, is we've seen uh, a real challenge coming out of COVID with attendance, and the the way Texas chooses to fund its schools is is completely based uh, on attendance. And so when you've got those challenges, it's obviously generating problems with funding. Um, and yet schools need to be staffed as if all the children are gonna be there each day, right? And so uh, when you don't know how many students are coming from day to day, it's really hard to, uh, to cut back on expenditures. So that kind of combination of factors has really uh, put schools in a bind all across our state uh, in the last year or so. Do you think the mechanism, the way that Texas funds public schools is flawed in some way? Is there a better method of doing that that you think lawmakers ought to look at? I, I do think that there is another conversation that, that uh, I have spoken to both Democrat and Republican lawmakers about uh, who are interested in the conversation, and that is funding schools based to some degree on attendance, but combining it with a funding stream that's based on enrollment. Uh, how many students are actually enrolled in the school at a time so that when you do have a public health situation like a, a large flu outbreak or COVID, that uh, you schools don't get cut in funding when students just aren't able to be there because of their health. And a two-part question here, when do you have those conversations about changing how they do this funding, as well as now in this time with the pandemic and health concerns and safety concerns, how do we incre increase enrollment? Yeah, I think with well, the second part's especially challenging. The The question on when do we have those conversations is now. Frankly, it's it's been in the last couple of months those conversations have begun, and they'll need to continue right up to the start of the legislative session uh, at the beginning of 2023. Um, increasing enrollment has proved to be really uh, challenging. Uh, you've got the impact of COVID, uh, which certainly has uh, caused some folks to move to homeschool and to online programs and so forth. Uh, and at least in the urban areas of our state, because of the kind of uh, permissive nature in Texas about charter school expansion, uh, schools are also losing students uh, to, to charters. Uh, and that is also putting pressure on enrollment. And so increasing enrollment has been a challenge I will say that we have seen a greater desire to come back to pre-K and kinder uh, in the last, say, six or eight months than we had prior during the pandemic. Um, a lot of those parents and you know, students at that grade level looked at online learning and said that just won't work, and that is completely understandable. Uh, and yet we're afraid to send them for health reasons, and we've seen that turn around uh, quite a bit in the last few months. And so to be clear here, the comptroller is saying that Texas could have a $27 billion surplus for the next legislative session that starts in January. And at the same time, we're having these conversations about the effect of COVID. There is certainly concern about school safety. What are schools doing to keep kids safe? That costs money as well. There is something uh, which I, I know you could explain a little bit more about the school safety allotment and how that breaks down to really a cost per student for something like that. No, you're, you're absolutely right. The, the state allocates currently $9.72 per student for that's dedicated to school safety spending. Uh, when you look at what it costs to secure a school building, whether that's via facilities and technology or via police officers or uh, so much of the other uh, uh, items we use to secure schools, ballistic security lobbies, for instance, that funding just doesn't go very far, right? 
um, it just doesn't cover even the one-time costs, much less the ongoing costs, like having a police department that's well-trained and and uh, well-equipped and so forth. Um, and so there has been quite a lot of conversation, as you might imagine, uh, about substantially increasing uh, that funding. And and I don't know a single school person or parent who believes that that's not uh, an appropriate way to use state dollars. And so I am hoping for a robust conversation about that uh, here in the next few months. With so many parents hesitant to send their kids to school, is there something you say to them to encourage them or make them feel safe? Yeah, I, I, I think there is. I, one, I would say that um, school safety is not something that, that school folks just consider after one of these tragedies, right? This, it's an ongoing concern. It's an ongoing budget expenditure. Uh, that has existed for many, many years, right? We have been working to secure schools and improve the way we secure schools uh, as as often as we can afford to do that and as obviously as technology improves. So what, what we've done some this summer is explain to parents what's already in place, right? What, what has already existed uh, in the way of school security that may not be completely visible to them if they just come and drop their child off and perhaps pick up in the afternoon. And so we spent some time doing that and, and have had some good comments uh, about that. But we're always looking to enhance what can we do, right? How do we uh, improve? How do we use existing technology and improve building security? How do we enhance our processes and our procedures, which are things over which uh, we have actually the most control and, and probably cost the least amount of money. Um, we look at, can we afford to add uh, police officers to our force so that we're better protective uh, of our schools? So that is a constant conversation. And certainly it's been enhanced by uh, the, the tragedy in Uvalde, but, uh, but it really has always uh, been a part of what we consider and budget for. And before we let you go, Dr. Woods, you know, if somebody, a parent especially, anybody in the community is hearing you shed some light on, on this funding mechanism and the underfunding issue that so many schools face and they want to do something about it, what's your recommendation? What can somebody act on now to try to keep this conversation going? I, I, the answer to that is just absolutely clear cut, and that is call uh, the state legislators who represent you. And, and express your concern. Uh, and if you see a solution, either the one that I suggested or another, make that suggestion. Um, I think as long as legislators understand that people besides school superintendents and teachers are concerned about this, that it applies to parents and members of the community, right? I hear from all kinds of community members who no longer have students in school who are very concerned about school safety. And rightfully so, we should all be. Uh, and, and I say the same thing to those folks. Please call your members and express concern because it kind of keeps the awareness level heightened, right? It keeps it front and center for, uh, for lawmakers. And that is uh, that right now is a very good thing for schools and for the children that we serve. Dr. Brian Wood, superintendent with Northside ISD. Thanks so much for sharing some time with us here. Uh, we want to wish you a happy, safe start. Uh, best of luck. Year. Sure. Absolutely. To everybody in the district and beyond. Thanks for your time. Thanks very much. Have a good evening. You too. We'll be right back. Look outside with live cam. We don't have to tell you. It's plenty hot out there and just still so dry, Justin. So dry. It, we've got some clouds moving in, but it's not helping with our temperatures. We're still at 102 right now in highs today. We made it up to 103 here in San Antonio, tying a record. New Braunfels was up around 103, Seguin 102, Burning Sage 97. And it's not just us. A large portion of the country is dealing with some big time heat, including here in Texas. It's still 106 right now, which Shaw Falls, if you can believe that. And as we look uh, across the entire country, it's even 101 up in Bismarck, North Dakota. Heat advisories up and down the plains. We'll talk about when this heat subsides and what about rain chances? That forecast is coming up. We are still waiting for something to change in the forecast. <laughs> it looks mm. the same. But with these slight rain chances, if we get it or don't, silver lining is it cools things off a little bit, right? Just, for, for just a, a, I mean, we'll take whatever we can second. get. 
or a hot, uh, literally a hot second. <laughs> literally a hot second. <laughs> you know, just to <laughs> fall under 100 degrees for a, a day would be nice if we could get that. It looks like that's a possibility. We've got some more moisture moving in, and I think that'll help us with temperatures a little bit. I want to talk about the hurricane season, though, real quick. Noah put out a new forecast today. They, they typically do this kind of halfway through the season, and they still think, despite the fact that there's not much out there, we haven't seen much, that it will be an above-average season because of the La Nina pattern that tends to bring more Atlantic hurricanes and more Atlantic activity. Still calling for 14 to 20 named storms, 6 to 10 hurricanes, and 3 to 5 major hurricanes. That is above average. We'll see if things can get kickstarted here, but right now it is still really quiet out there in the Pacific. It has been active there. We've got one system trying to develop that likely becomes something in the, cur in the uh, next few days. But as we look at the Atlantic, there's just nothing there, no development over the next five days. And th there is a wave coming off of Africa that looks somewhat healthy, but it's running into some dust. We've got that Saharan dust still working its way across the Atlantic, and that dust tends to suppress any tropical activity. So as long as it's there, we may not see a whole lot. Now, th the peak of hurricane season is in early September, so we've still got some time for things to kind of get going here. We'll see. We'll let you know if uh, anything does begin to develop. In the meantime, we've got uh, partly cloudy skies outside right now. Some high clouds moving through. Still 102. Notice the feels like number, though, 101. And that's because the air is so dry. So it kind of goes the opposite way. When humidity drops, the feels like number actually goes below the air temperature. And temperatures at this hour, 102 Uvalde, 104 Carrizo Springs, 107 in Cotula, one of the hot spots in the country today. 102 New Braunfels, 101 in Austin. And a little closer look here at Bear County. We have dropped to 99 in Holotus, 100 in Rio Medina, and uh, 95 up there at Canyon Lake. Uh, there is still a pretty good breeze out of the south, still gusting around 20 miles per hour. That is going to usher in that moisture back into the area tonight, so it will get humid once again. But the dew points right now are in the upper 50s. You go east of town, the dew points do increase some. You'll find dew points in the 50s and 60s there. KSAT 12 hour forecast 96 at 8 o'clock, 93, 9 p.m. Mostly clear, I'd say, uh, until about 4 a.m. when we start seeing more cloud cover. And clouds will be there in the morning, but they won't last long. And we'll probably see uh, mostly sunny skies tomorrow afternoon. Now, this does get back up to around 100. A little cooler tomorrow than today, but not by much. Uh, we add in humidity and more moisture, though. So the heat index is probably going to be up around 103, 104. Just heads up tomorrow uh, with uh, that humidity there. And we, we also want to talk about... The current fire situation. We've still got three fires out there going in our area. Hermosa fire, 60 acres, it's 10% contained. It's a pretty small fire, but you got Smoke Rider, which is growing, but it is 70% contained. And then Big Sky is 1,400 acres, it's 50% contained. Good news, too, with that added moisture tomorrow is that we think that the fire danger is probably a little bit lower. It's still in the moderate category, but a little bit lower than it has been last couple days. So that is a bit of good news. Uh, we're watching some of that moisture off to our east showers and storms around Louisiana, and that's what we're hoping will bring us a chance for a few showers tomorrow. I think generally east of I-35, it's just a 10% chance tomorrow afternoon. But on Saturday, as that moisture spreads further west, we'll have a little better chance, 20% shot on your Saturday. It's still hit or miss type stuff. A few folks will get lucky and maybe get a downpour. And that does drag temperatures down 98 on Saturday with that 20% chance of rain. Some coastal showers Sunday through Tuesday, but we're still back up around 100 degrees each and every day, guys. Triple digits. Yep. What we've seen a lot of. Mm -hmm. Those grass and brush fires are uh, some scary stuff, so hopefully Mother Nature will help us out a little bit. Yeah, that, that would be wonderful. In case you missed it, coming up next. It is Thursday, August 4th. A historic international takedown of a human smuggling ring. Four Guatemalan men were arrested, indicted, and are awaiting extradition to the U.S. This marks the first case of its kind in Guatemala. The Justice Department and its partner agencies, including Homeland Security and Border Patrol, announcing today the top leadership of a smuggling ring named Alpha Siete were made possible by the Joint Task Force Alpha. The investigation began in spring of last year after the death of a migrant woman whose family had paid $10,000 to the smugglers. The men face four federal charges and, if convicted, could face life in prison.
An update now on a fatal shooting at a Northside gym from Monday. The victim is identified as 34-year-old Brandon Broadnax. He was shot and killed inside the LA Fitness on Blanco Road while working out. The suspect, Jesse McWilliams, was arrested down the street. He faces a murder charge. The motive is still being investigated. Four Louisville police officers involved in the deadly Breonna Taylor raid now facing civil rights violations. The Justice Department charged officers Joshua Jaynes, Brett Henkison, and Kelly Goodland along with Sergeant Kyle Meany. Louisville officers shot and killed Taylor after they knocked down her door while executing a search warrant. Take a look at this, a creepy creek in New Jersey with bright red waters. Just outside of Philadelphia, a portion of Pinsocken Creek turned red. Officials say it happened after the Top Pop Packaging Company improperly discharged red dye into the wastewater treatment system. While the substance was not hazardous, the beverage manufacturer did receive a violation. Officials explained the red dye should clear in 24 to 48 hours. Even at this hour, we're still sitting at 100 degrees. We'll be up around 100 tomorrow, but there is a small chance for shower, mainly east of I-35. 20% chance of an isolated shower storm on Saturday. Otherwise, pretty much status quo. Triple digits Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday. Guys. All right, thank you, Justin. Before we go, we have an update on the punishment of Jorge Izquierdo. He was found guilty today of killing his girlfriend. He's been sentenced now to 50 years behind bars. Izquierdo must serve at least half of that sentence before being eligible for parole. We believe we'll have more at that coming up at 10. And of course, KSAT.com as well. Thanks so much for watching the news at 6.